Oscar, you okay? You okay? Radio silence. No answer. They mount up, they get in their cars, and they rush out of the base. What happened? What happened to our men? When they pulled up on the wreckage, a bomb had blown up under one of their Humvees, blown up to the sky, and twisted it like a corkscrew, and immediately the war brings us. One of the first patrols to the air base. This is where it gets weird. I'm a football coach here in Sacramento. And I get a call from a friend of mine up the road, and he says, Coach, Coach, your son's a Marine, right? I go, yeah, my son's a Marine. He goes, listen, some Marines just came next door to our neighbor's house, and I heard screaming, I heard crying. Something happened to their son. I go, who is it? I got to find out who it is. Come to find out that their son was killed. Come to find out that his name was Victor Dew, and he played football. I got to know the family, and as I was talking to them and loving on them, as they were buried, getting ready to bury their son, they said, Coach, we eulogize our son. I said, I'd be honored to. I've told this story 200 and some odd times, and I always cry at this moment. I'd be honored to eulogize your son. And I did, and I watched him get buried into the ground. Remember, my son is still there. And this heart gets even weirder. I get a phone call on a satellite phone, and when my son would call on a satellite phone from Afghanistan, it was always <laughs> creaky. He was like, Dad, Dad, son, son, you okay? You okay, son? Dad, Dad, my, my colonel tells me that a coach eulogized a Marine. Was that you, Dad? I said, yes, it was, son. It was me. He goes, Dad, you buried Victor Dew? I said, yeah. He goes, Dad, I was there. I pulled him out of the vehicle. Life changing. Life changing, guys. It was right after that that I got my friends. I got Patty, who's Victor Dew's mom. I got Rick Sutter, who's a coach at Granite Bay. And I said, we got to do something. We got to do something to give back to these guys who are losing their legs and losing their lives. They're doing everything for us. That's the story of the Honorable, the greatest high school football showcase in America. That's what you guys are in. I wanted you guys to know the story so you feel it. When you're out there today and you're playing for each other, to the man to the right and to the man on the left of you, remember. Lay it on the line. This is the honor. All right, I got another friend that I want to have speak to you, and then after that, then after that, I'm going to break down some housekeeping because there's some real cool stuff we do here. And then you guys can play the game. Now, you got something real quick to say? <laughs> <laughs> okay, just, you know, I'm going to and just real quick, I want to tell you a quick little story of what happened when the rest of his uh, brothers came back. I got to hear on my son's last day. They were ready to go out of their father for an operating base to do the mission that they needed to do. They know that they're in Taliban country. They know that there's IED bombs out there. They know that they're going to be shot at. They know all these things. Guess what? Think they're scared? Darn right they're scared. My, I was told my son looked at them and said, hey, we've trained, we're ready, we got this. That's a hell of a statement to say, coming back to these guys who just experienced and saw their brothers killed. So I'm going to ask you, are you trained? Yes, are you trained? Yes, ma'am. Are you ready? Yes, ma'am. Are you going to win? Yes, ma'am. I'd like to introduce to you um, Gunnery Sergeant Freddie Torres. Gunnery, Good afternoon. It's a tremendous privilege and honor to stand in front of you today. Uh, I'm going to go a little bit quick. So, 2001, I was an athlete just like you were. September 11th happened. I knew I wanted to join the Marine Corps right then and then. Graduated in 2005, 2006. I joined the Marine Corps. 
And I'm going to fast forward to 2010 to that report, and I'm going to share a quick story with you. Hopefully, you can take a piece of this story and take it with you when you're facing adversity, some challenges, or roadblock. So December 30th, just three months, two months after Victor Hugh died and three other Marines on October 13th, there was a, a patrol of Marines out. There was a squad of Marines out on patrol for about three, four hours. They gathered some information, talked to some local nationals, and run their way back to the patrol base. Now, if you can paint this picture in your head, Lone Survivor, the movie with Marcus Luttrell, when they're on top of the mountains, they're overseeing that little village. It's all mud huts, it's all dirt alleyways, dirt roads. That's exactly what Saint Afghanistan looks like. So this squad is making their way back into their patrol base. One of the Marines in the back of the patrol steps on an IE and improvised explosive device, roadside bombs. Luckily, that bomb didn't go off all the way. Only a piece of it did. All it did was shatter that Marine's foot, broke his ankle, got him in a truck, got him in a uh, plane, or got him in a helicopter, got him stateside, he's good. Now, because that entire bomb didn't go off, those Marines were still responsible to go out there and blow the rest of it so the Taliban won't pick it up and reuse it. So that squad sent four Marines back out to that area. As they were placing another stick of demolition down and getting ready to blow it, the Taliban from the east, from those murder holes, from the, the potholes, they started engaging and firing and suppressing at those four Marines. Three of, the Marines, three of the Marines ran to the north, one of the Marines ran to the east, picked up his rifle, started shooting back, running towards the enemy. Now he ran that direction, there was a little divot and a little wall, a bit uh, waist high, where he was going to get behind and start suppressing back. As he got to that divot, he fell on his back, tried to raise himself up, and he looked down and he was completely covered in red. He had been shot twice. His uniform was filled with blood. To the west, here comes two, that one Marine, one of the Marines out of the three, running towards him under fire, suppressing the enemy. And he slides in, takes his scissors off, cuts his pants off, and he sees blood gushing out. His reward artery had been hit. So immediately, applies gauze, he immediately takes a tourniquet, slaps it on tight, and he calls for the squad that's inside the patrol base to bring a stretcher out to, to carry this brain out. A couple minutes pass, they get him on a stretcher, he gets out there. On the count of three, they're going to get this brain up, they start moving him out. And they do so. They start engaging the enemy. The Marines getting moved the last 50 meters back inside the patrol base where there's a truck waiting for them. But on that 50 meters, that Marine in that stretcher put his hand up to his best friend and said to him, tell my mom I love her and tell my boys I'm sorry. And he squeezed his hand a little tighter and he said, tell my mom I love her and tell my boys I'm sorry. Well, the last words he said to him on the battlefield, where he got put in the truck before I could put in the helicopter and brought back stateside. Now let me share the second half of that story where you can use this when you're facing your challenge adversities, roadblocks, whatever you're going through, you've gone through. That Marine was laying here in California, in San Diego, in January 2011, and the doctor came to him. They said, what, we're taking your leg. It's getting amputated. There's too much nerve damage. By the way, there's a medical retirement coming your way because you're never going to be able to walk and run the same way again. January 2011, that Marine took that as a challenge. He said, by April 2011, when that squad comes back, that plane lands at March Air Force Base in Southern California, and that ramp comes down, I'm going to be standing there at the bottom of that ramp, hugging every single one of my squad members. That's what they said. And I'll tell you right now, April 15th, when that plane did land and those stairs did come down, I was standing there at the bottom of that staircase, ready to receive and hug every single one of my squad members. After the coaches, or after the doctors told me that the leg was going away, after they told me that my medical retirement was, was coming up. 12 years later, I stand in front of you sharing that story, not to put myself up here. I share that story because some of you have faced an injury. Some of you are going to face a hit out there. Some of you, you're, you're, somebody in your life is going to tell you you won't or you can't. And it's up to you to either accept that or take the challenge and show them something different. I used to say that was luck, that was coincidence. That was I trained my squad so dang well that they knew what they were doing. And it was, I was far from, from being right. That was God that kept me around for a purpose. That was God that kept me here for a reason, whether that reason was to share this story and hope that one of you takes that and does something with it. So I tell you that when you're facing something, adversity challenges, you take a piece of that story 
and you don't let yourself become a failure. Because I could have been a failure, and in my eyes, I was a failure if I would have taken it. I failed at something. I picked myself up. I dusted it off. I learned from it, and I did something great with it. Go out there and do the same thing every single day, not just as a football player, but as a man, as a, as a boyfriend, as a son, as a fill the blank, whatever title it is. Do out, go out there and do great things with it. Good luck on your game. Again, it's an honor and privilege. Thank you for playing for the 25 grade plus. Anybody that's gotten fours, good luck out there. God bless every single one of you. Thank you. Good enjoy. When a serviceman or woman is lost in the battlefield, it has become customary to arrange their rifle, pointing downward, downward along with their boots and their helmets. Surviving members of their squad gather around and memorialize their fallen comrades. Some of the troops will pray. Others might recall personal stories, but make no mistake. This is a ceremony that is taken very seriously. Why? Because, because every soldier knows the next ceremony could be for them. When, when a rifle with men is down on the ground, it is a more memorial of a soldier killed in action. It also signals a time for prayer, a prayer in the action, to pay a tribute to our friend, friend and hero. hero. Placing the rifle with the Federal Reserve Sergeant Frederick Torres, drove his instructor to Marine Corps, recruiting folks in San Diego, San Diego. Petty Sergeant Torres is a Purple Hall recipient and was wounded in action in the Helmand Province, Afghanistan, 2000. represent the final march of the soldier's last mile. Placing the boots are Leslie Wade, President of Rolling Hills Blue Star Hunt, also, and Debbie Kahn Valen, President of Sacramento Blue Star Moms, Sacramento. The helmet is also a symbol of this great sacrifice. 
and the moment is being placed by Gold Star Dad, Tom Schumacher, honoring his son left Corporal Victor Dew, 20, of Granite Bay, California. The dog tags identify the soldier's name so he or she will never be forgotten. Placing the tags is Gold Star Mother Patty Schumacher, honoring her son, U.S. Marine Lance Corporal Victor Dew 20 of Granite Bay, California. He was assigned to the 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines, Camp Pendleton, California, and he died October 13, 2010, in the Sagan District of Yelman Province. The dog tags that Patty is placing on the right are the actual tags that Victor wore when he was killed. Now, now ladies and gentlemen, while you're still standing in our Gold Star families and military members are centered on the 50-yard line, we would, we would like to acknowledge our new fallen heroes from a tragic Osprey crash in Melville Island, Australia, during a joint international treaty in August of 2023. No family ever wants to become a Gold Star family, but it is a title they wear in their hearts forever. At this time, we will honor our new three heroes, right, by remembering to say their names. I will say their name individually and will direct you when to repeat their name. After, we will, we will have, have a moment of silence, of silence followed by the playing, the playing of, of tests. Corporal, Corporal Spencer, Spencer R. Collert, say Spencer Collert. Spencer Collert. Captain, Captain Eleanor B. Lobo, say Eleanor Lobo.
to receive.